Hello, this is Barry Cashin of The Remains. Uh, let's see, The Remains were formed in uh, the fall of 1964 at Boston University. I had just come back from a summer in Europe, you know, and I saw the kinks on television over there doing You Really Got Me. I just looked at that and I said, this is something I got to do. When I got back to BU, I went to my friend in the dorm with whom I had been playing some frat party gig, and I told him all about what I saw in, um, in England. The story of the remains and how I started the band, I have to, you know, inject here that if I, if I had not smoked pot in Europe, <laughs> maybe this never would have happened. The impetus was hearing music, you know, after smoking some pretty strong stuff from Africa that I've had in France and it was my first time like whoa I went into this club and I heard this heard this band in London and um, oh my god and I, I took a chair sort of next to the drummer because we had spent some time together you know I had just <laughs> smoked some of this stuff out on the street and then I went into the club so I could not believe what I was seeing I realized that the band was playing but they, they weren't just like wanging away on their instruments and not paying any attention to each other the reverse was true they were listening intently to each other the thing that got me was there was this blue light the blue light shone down onto the stage. What I got was that, that these members of the band were having a conversation and they were make, each making statements to each other and this blue circle on the stage floor was like the round table. They were conversing. So that was the thing. And I, so when I got back to Boston, I said to the guys, Tim Byrne and Bill, the key factor is to listen to each other. Really keep listening to each other and play to each other and off of each other. So that's really what ended up melding the group together and we made some very fast progress as far as getting tight goes. So that was in like November of 64. Between fall of 64 and spring of 66, we had been going to school and playing gigs. And we had a good booking agent and we bought a red Econoline van and played probably every college in New England twice. We were, we were kind of a hot item there. We went to New York for six weeks to play a gig at a club in the village called Trudy Heller's. One night, Ed Sullivan shows up, sat and listened to our set, and after the set, he got up and came over the stage and said, you know, I'd like to have you boys on my show next Sunday. We couldn't believe it, and we just, if I had it to do over again, probably would have played Why Do I Cry, but what did we do instead? Vern and I wrote a song and debuted it on the Sullivan Show, a song called uh, Let Me Through. At, at first, we thought it was a terrible sound. They wouldn't let us have the amps on stage. They had the, the go-go dancers behind us, so my amp was like 25 feet away. I could barely hear it. So then a couple months later, we did Hullabaloo. It was before the the album was out way before. I what was out then? I think Diddy Wah Diddy. I think that's what we played on Hullabaloo. We were, we were a little bit still feeling snafu'd about the mix on the Sullivan show, so we arranged for Epic to send up a backing track. We did the live vocal to Diddy Wah Diddy, but used the track in all other instruments. Kind of an unusual setup. That's what we did. So we were on a gig in Westport, Connecticut, which happens to be my hometown. Chip, out of the blue, starts to talk to me about, you know, he's just not happy. With, we, we, by that time, actually had moved to New York. So Chip was just fed up with living in an apartment in a city. He just wasn't happy with the whole situation of being in a band and trying to make it. So he quit, just like that. Boom. There's the challenge. Go on the Beatles tour without our original member laying down the beat. You know, there's no way we were going to not go on the tour. So our kind of new manager in New York sent over a drummer, and that was uh, N.D. Smart III. And N.D. was a, he was younger than us. He was, he was like, I don't know, maybe 16 or something. But he was, he was good. He was a very good drummer. 
He just became my drummer and went on the Beatles tour with us. You know, we rehearsed. I don't think we played many gigs before the tour. So really, like the debut of this band with a new drummer was the first show of the Beatles tour. The foursome of the original remains had been together since the beginning. And we played a lot of gigs, hundreds of gigs together. And it just didn't seem right to, to have a different drummer. By the time the Beatles tour was over, you know, nothing against MD Smart or anything, but I just had had it, and I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. We'd had, let's see, Why Do I Cry, Diddy Wah Diddy, one of um, Vern's songs, I Can't Get Away From You, and then um, just as we were leaving to go on the Beatles tour, Don't Look Back was released, so while we were on the Beatles tour, we were doing Don't Look Back. Come to think of it, N.D. Smart was the drummer on Don't Look Back, you know, a month before the, the Beatles tour started. The last date was in San Francisco, and it was the last gig they, they really ever played. August 29th, 1966. I've got my book here um, to refer to, Ticket to Ride, The Extraordinary Diary of the Beatles' Last Tour. Day by day, city by city, showing photos taken in every city and fan recollections and my journal, which my dad told me to, to keep while I was on the tour. So these guys, the Beatles, are pretty famous. It might be interesting to take some notes. And it was the Remains' first time really straying out of New England. It was a challenge to play, to open for the Beatles and playing for 50,000 people. The crowd being so far away and probably most of the other people never heard of the Remains. Given all that, we had a very good reception, good feedback from it. Still was time to take a vacation from it. That's what happened, and it became more or less of a permanent vacation. It was interesting when the band broke up because, you know, we had signed this contract <laughs> with uh, Columbia. So I think it was like a three-year contract. I never heard anything from anybody, but our, our album was really September of 66, after the Beatles tour was over. The single of Don't Look Back had hit the chart, but like, you know, we weren't around to support it. The album came out and it had 10 songs on it. A lot of the songs that later appeared on the Sunday's releases that Bob put out were not included on the original album. I don't know. I guess they didn't sound as polished to the Columbia brass. I had met Graham in Boston years before and knew him a little bit. And after the Beatles tour, they kind of moved in with his band called the International Submarine Band. Years later, he called that he was doing this album. This was after he was, had gone to France for a long time and was hanging out with Keith Richards. He said he wanted me to be part of it. And I went to L.A. and got in the studio, and there, there's James Burton and all these other great pickers. And Emmy Lou was there. That's how I met her. That ended up being Grant's first solo album, P.P. I'm playing rhythm guitar and singing on that. And then the show we did in Boston in 1969 was the first time we got back together. And it makes it a little bit of a you know, special occasion. Okay, the Boston Tea Party was a venue in Boston. It was kind of like an East Coast version of the film. It was in a big old church, Kipkis Lane Drum. You can just tell by the tightness of the group on the album. I, I don't even remember what's on there, but I know there's at least one, you know, like the Muddy Waters song. I was really shy about playing our own material at gigs back then. I didn't realize that that's really basically the job. <laughs> uh, so we did play a lot of covers on our gigs. Uh, you know, with all the stuff that I loved at the time, Stones and Kink, Zombies, you know, it was really our own arrangement, no doubt, no doubt. It's obvious when you listen to it. So things were pretty quiet on the Remains front from the 60s to the 90s, really. So there was this popular box set that came out. It was called Nugget. I think um, Lenny K was the person who put that together. And he included Don't Look Back, a song written by Billy Vera. I think that really opened the door for the remains to a lot of younger listeners and a new generation. And then when they revamped the Nuggets and expanded it, they also put Why Do I Cry on there. Thanks, Lenny. Bob Irwin contacted me from his label Sundays and was very excited about putting out some of the material that he discovered in some of the Columbia Vault. He's had a great relationship with Sundays ever since. When Bob started with Sundays, the royalties started to come in, and that, that's a good thing. <laughs> 
however you look at it. Definitely a resurgence happened as a result of Sunday's release, of which there have been mono albums, stereo albums, double albums, single albums, 10-inch albums. Bob, Bob goes to town. He knows how to do it. <laughs> 